But the point is that there's extremely viable, valuable opportunities. The point is it's the 20 billion tons, so we don't want to just go to zero net. Your Prime Minister has sort of asked, you know, there you go, has sort of said, okay, can New Zealand lead in zero net? When can we get there? But basically we're saying easy, but we can do better. We can go to negative net. Negative net. Okay? Because that's the 20 billion tons. But now comes a disappointment. Because even if we did 20 billion tons, sorry guys, it's too late. Okay? Because to do this, we need, we haven't got the time. The oceans contain 38,000 billion tons of carbon dissolved the CO2 in them. The atmosphere is 750 billion tons of carbon. So the oceans have 50 times more carbon in them. And of course, as we reduce this atmospheric carbon level, the oceans will say, thank you very much, give a bit of a burp, not a very loud burp, and just return that CO2 back into the air. So we're here for 100 to 1,000 years plus, drawing down carbon, even at negative net, to try and get this CO2 level down. So again, we have to start thinking differently because, hey, we can't do that. But then again, do we need to do that? There's no question that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It drives 4% of the global heat dynamics. We know that, 4%. But also we know that people die in submarines at 10,000 parts per million CO2. You and I breathe out air that's got 1,000 parts per million CO2. So, you know, like we're not going to die instantly at 420. Which comes back to actually the bigger issue of hydrology, right? Because in a sense, it's hydrology that for the last 4.2 billion years on this planet has driven 95% of the heat dynamics. It's heat dynamics. Okay? So the question is, we haven't looked at it, it was all too complicated and we assumed it was all natural and therefore not influenced by us. And it's too hard to model, so basically that's why they didn't model it, or couldn't model it. But the issue is, you see, here we have a factor of 95% of the heat dynamics of the blue planet, and in a sense, if we want to cool this sucker, why aren't we using these hydrological processes rather than this dead end of CO2? We'll be using the bed springs as part of that solution. No question, this is the resource pit for bed springs, but not for cooling the planet. Right, so that gets to the next step, okay? Um, we'll actually, yeah, then we'll keep it, yeah, we've we'll got to keep it quick. So let's just sort of go now quickly into the actual game of how do we rehydrate landscapes. We can come into more details, there's so much detail, it's all hard science verified, so no issue. But how do we actually look at the hydrology of regions in rehydrating the planet? And the first thing we have to say there again, like we humans always want more, more, more. But it's not really how much we have, it's what we do with what we do have. How efficiently we can serve and use what we do have. Okay, now Australia, for example, we can say gets 100 raindrops. New Zealand gets more than that. No point us being envious of New Zealand's more raindrops. It's how efficiently we use every raindrops. And I'll illustrate with data from the Murray-Darling Basin, because it's about a 100 million hectare watershed, but it's really the crunch for 40% plus of Australia's agriculture. And the situation is, yeah, we get 100 raindrops, and of course we know that 99 fall on the soils. Nature, you know, natural bread, you know, etc. But then of that 99, because it's managed, yeah, 12 end up in streams, and two end up in dams. Not because we haven't built dams, and that's happened around the world. We've built 50,000 large dams since the Second World War. Many of them are dry, silted up, and then decommissioned, but that's another story. Okay, not that there's a shortage of oil. 
Yeah, not that we haven't built dams, but they're not functioning in many ways. Okay, but the problem is it's these dams and this water and this mentality, this is where we get basically most of our domestic water, industrial water, irrigation water. Okay, so we've created a system where, hey, this is where our water security is based on, on this water from dams and, of course, from irrigation. And in the Murray-Darling Basin, we basically had the politicians getting very alarmed and we put $15 billion into a you know, Murray-Darling Basin review, um, water buyback, etc. But money isn't water, right? So you spend all the money you like on externalities and Ponzi schemes and you know, entitlements and what have you. It doesn't actually make more water. But the real crisis or the real issue is what happens to the 86 drops. Okay, there's 86 drops that weren't there. And of those 36 are used in transpiration, green, right, nature, and 50 are used as evaporation and runoff, which is Phyllis's um, flour and bread example, isn't it? It's a loss of that water. And here we are. We've got 25 times more water that we're wasting and losing, okay, than we actually have got in our dams. But more importantly, this water is right across the landscape. It's where and when we need it. Water is extremely expensive to transport, it's very heavy. And of course here is water, if we could have it, which would be available. And so again, the thinking we have to, in a sense, come around to, is really, yeah, rather than thinking here about dams, here's our industrial you know, water system, how do we actually rehydrate, regenerate the landscape? which comes to the next graph, which really sort of puts it all in a very simple nutshell, because we call this a hydrograph. Okay? And of course, every engineer, every bureaucrat, every you know, civil accountant sort of understands this. And a hydrograph is a simple diagram of flow over time. Okay, and if we have a, for example, a 50 millimeter rainfall event, two inches of rainfall, and just say we have that on a conventional degraded soil catchment, we'll just say 0.3% carbon, but it's just relative to figures, we know we've got a particular hydrograph from that. And of course that hydrograph, as we all predict and know pretty well, goes, there we go. Always goes something like this, right? Okay, so what we end up with a flood peak. And of course, we've got erosion. We've got damage. We've got cost. Not just cost from the damage, but we've got cost in terms of the social infrastructure. Because we've got to build a lot of civil engineering, concrete, culverts, stormwater drains, what have you. So massive sunk cost infrastructure, we've got massive sunk costs in terms of insurance against floods and what have you. And so this is really, in a sense, very, very negative. So these are costs and then, of course, major risk. But far beyond that, this actually generates another whole series of consequences. Because by having this flood, by design, Logically, we also have designed in a drought. Because the water that, in a sense, got lost in the flood isn't in our soils, isn't available. So guess what? It's the reverse side of the coin. It's a drought. And of course, we've got more erosion, more massive costs, more massive risk. For farmers, it's particularly critical because that risk isn't just in the damage there and then, the risk is in the lack of reliability you've got now. See, farmers is a really, really dangerous gamble because we're saying we're putting, borrowing half a million dollars or so from the bank. Can we put in a crop or can we do something? But we're gambling with the weather. Hey, will we have a season that we 
should be able to be predictable in pursuing your car. But if we can't do that, then basically, instead of having reliable crops or whatever, four years out of five, we're down to two years out of five. This is analogous to playing Russian roulette with four chambers loaded. Not healthy. And that's in a sense what farmers been put in. So it's actually the reliability of rain. Reliability. Okay? This is the real guts that sort of kicks farmers in the you know, really brings them down. Because yeah, in our situation now, if we've only got two years out of five where we've got a reliable crop, we've got the bank manager at the front door after three years for closing. We used to have a, a bit in this game now with farmers, you know, with the farmers for 12 years since retiring. And we started, I started off, we said, hey, we've got 120,000 farmers in Australia. We've now got 85, 90,000 farmers in Australia. So it's going down because these reliabilities and viabilities in the current model on this sort of you know, projection because of this sort of mentality, because of, or taken away because of these compacted, degraded soils, just isn't adding up. But what happens if we increase the carbon content in our soils to say to 3%? Okay, and if we do that, as in nature did with the sponge, and you already got the picture there in a way, but we get a fundamental, make it green, because basically this is. Green is supposedly good, it's, oh no, it's a blue again now. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. We're black, black. Okay, we get a fundamentally different hydrograph. Because the same volume will be under the graph, but now the graph will go something like this. Okay? And of course there will be some runoff. Yep, there'll be runoff filling up our streams and dams, no question. But most of that water will go into our in-soil reservoirs. Okay, we've already more or less made that picture here. And of course, that is really fundamental because if we have that soil there, we get another function which is really where farmers really benefit, right? Because now we get longevity of green. Okay, and you're in the business of longevity of green. Okay, um, I started off research, not in, graduated in the 60s, started off in the 70s, green revolution, and it was all about can we increase yield, right? Can we put things on to increase yield? We put fertilizers on, if we can get a 30% growth response, fantastic. If we do breeding and get 20% growth, you know, everybody's smiling. Okay? But the point is, it's a longevity of green. It's not the area of green, it's not the genetic rate of the green, it's the time, the longevity. And we can see this on this graph, isn't it? Because whereas here, for the point three, we've got a growing season, which is basically that time. It might be 50 millimeters of rain, we might have 10 days of growth post rain, right? Whereas here, we've got a growing season that goes 200 days plus. Okay? And the difference between 10 and 200 is 20-fold. Okay? 2,000% growth responses. Unheard of. Now, we get a 30% growth response, we get a clean white lab coat, a clipboard and queue up for a noble price. And here's 2,000%. Resilience, productivity, all from, in a sense, increasing, all from increasing the carbon in our soil. Okay? So I think that's sort of trying to reinforce the message, yeah, fed springs matter, right? If we can get carbon in our soil, it's actually profoundly valuable and beneficial. Okay? And so that becomes actually the point of agency that we have as humans to address the hydrology, to address, I mean, we haven't talked about global cooling and stuff like that, we can do later if you like, to address the actual natural hydrological cooling, to address each of those 
air, water, food, habitat, resilience, paradigms, imperatives that we're actually facing globally. And it's all around rebuilding these bed streams, rebuilding the earth's soil carbon sponge. The logical next question then comes, right, okay, you talk about it, talk about it, but really how do we do it, right? How do we actually rebuild the earth's soil carbon sponge, not hypothetically, academically, but actually practically on the ground? So, as I sort of said, it's basically how do we do this practically, naturally, and of course, yes, critically important. And of course, again, we just go back to what did she do? What did Mother Nature do, right? And as we had in the rock, you know, the first colonization rock, and actually did explain it, we talked about the lichens, but then very quickly, of course, the lichens, then by creating the sponge, by retaining water, okay, it wasn't it just lichens, it was liverworts, mosses, ferns, cycads, gymnosperms, angiosperms, grasses, very rapidly in succession. So by the end of the Carboniferous, you know, basically 300 million years, we had this prolific forest all over the world, 14 billion hectares of land. So both the evolution of plant life and of course then the extension of plant life in areas. So in media. And so we say, hey, that's all we have to do. We just have to do what nature does. And keeping it very simple, it's as simple as A, B, and C. Right? And we all know this because we went to school. And basically, as we just said, it's all about these guys. And this is a plant, right? Because that's what nature used, evolved all these plants. And it's all about A, B, and C. So this is how to actually practically build bed springs, but also bigger picture, regenerate the hydrology, resilience and productivity of agri-system. And it starts off with A, obviously, and that's all about agriculture. Okay, and the bottom line, and you know, like you can reassure yourself, you do what you're doing. You know, like we have been perfecting agriculture, and hey, we've got to do more of it. Max it out, right? So don't feel guilty about any of this, just do it. Maximize. You know, it's all about, of course, photosynthesis, isn't it? And that's what nature sort of showed us 3.5 billion years ago. It's CO2 plus water, sunlight, giving you C6H12O6, and we've got this oxygen as a waste product. Okay? And there's sixes, we've got to balance our valencies, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, it's all about basically photosynthesis and it's maximizing plant growth, basically the business we're in. And New Zealand is some of the best globally, right? So you know how to do this really well. And it's not actually the numbers you do, it's just doing it well on every hectare that you've got. We've got, I work with sugarcane farmers and we're doing 200 tonnes of biomass per hectare per annum above the ground. Okay? Um, but it's not the numbers, it's just the thing, let's max that out, right? Let's, let's do that, because this is what the business is. But then we have to, again, be balanced as in nature. Because it's not just a question of what we do. I mean, we live here in this space above the ground, you know, I'm no sapien. But basically, how do we then look at ecology? Because as Phil has mentioned, you know, the whole economy is a subset of the ecology. And really the issue is what happens to every molecule, every gram of sugar that we do produce. You know, it's not just growing it, but then what happens to it. And all through history there's only two things that can happen. That's all that's happened. It's either burnt, either fast through fire, or slow through oxidation, and of course that's given back to CO2, or it's turned into stable soil carbon. Okay? And that's it. It's either B or C. And this is a powerful message, you see, because we control B and we control C through our land management. 
the practices we use. But nature's already on your side because basically she puts 40% of the biomass up here above the ground, that's the 200 billion tons, 200 million, 200 tons per hectare, sorry. But there's 30% of the biomass in the roots, we tend to disregard, we break away from roots in fact. And there's another 30% that goes out as root exudates. And these are the sugars and amino acids that are actually feeding fungi and other microorganisms in the soil. Uh, make the point again always because it's the 21st century, 2020. There are fungi, there are also fungals, and there are funguses. So no sexism. Right? <laughs> okay, but there's this microbial life in the soil, and in a sense, it's 60% already down under. So this is the tour from underground, right? So basically, yeah, we've already got all this carbon, and all we have to make sure of is. Yeah, 15, 60% of A is invested in soil capital regeneration underground. Okay? And not burnt off. But in the last 60 years or so, we've actually we've actually sort of actually got misled because while we said this is what Homo sapien does, Homo hubris is in a different world. Because in trying to maximize this. We've just gone all out to say, look, let's get into moron strategies. <laughs> M-O-R-E-O-N, spell it right. <laughs> moron strategies. And so here we can cultivate, here we can add fertilizer, here we can add biocides. We have obviously irrigation. And we have bare fallows. And so basically we're doing everything we can to, of course, maximise our preferred part of A, you know, through cultivation. But all of this is massively energy intensive. You know, we're putting 10 units of oil in for every unit of food energy we get out. And of course that oil is all adding to these CO2 emissions. But much, much worse than that. Because all of these things are highly oxidated. Okay, when we cultivate soil, not only do we put all this oxygen, all this oxygen into that soil, so it's oxidizing, we expose it to ultraviolet, we kill the bugs, etc., etc. And so at the moment we're driving about 120% of A up into the air. Because we're driving most of this up into the air, but also we're driving a lot of the heritage legacy carbon that was in our soil oxidizing our soil. That's why we're down to 0.3. Not the 3, not the 5, not the 8 that was there naturally. Okay, so we're basically using a lot of inputs unwisely, excessively, because we haven't seen them as we haven't seen their oxidative externalities. That's an economic term. Right. Externalities. The previous discussion didn't consider externalities. At real cost, they kill, they maim, they compromise, but they have to be on the balance sheet. So <coughs> economics externalizes them. That's somebody else's problem. Because, like them, they, they have play pens as well, and they don't like externalities. Right? <laughs> okay, so that's the whole game. So, the, yeah, I've got a couple minutes. Basically, the whole game is, you know, like minimize. B, minimize the oxidation in our unmanned practices, maximize the growth of carbon, that's encouraging the natural fungi to put the humates, the glomalin back into the soils, which is really Phyllis's discussion about the bread, right? In a sense, that's what it does. And we can control that, and as we said, if we can get 60% of A, 60% of A going to C, we're actually doing really well. But just to finish off this discussion, there's a space here, and of course nature doesn't have vacuums, right? No spaces, so we've got another, have to put another D in, so we can't avoid this. We've got to have dividends. And this is really, really where the rubber hits the road, right? Because we already we wiped it off, but we already got that in that little soil diagram. Because for every gram of water, I mean, for every gram of carbon we put into that soil, 
We can get eight grams of water just in the matrix of the organic matter carbon, and we can get 20 plus grams of water in those voids in those in soil reservoirs that we create. So we have a whole sequence of positive feedback multiplier processes. Synergies, you know, 1 times 1 equals 25. Okay? And this is how nature works, just as she just basically added some nothing to create the sodom. These are these positive feedback multipliers. So 1 gram of carbon, 8 grams, or 8 plus grams of carbon. Every gram of carbon we add to the soil, we've already talked about that. Here is the exposure of the mineral nutrients, so the biofertility of that soil goes up massively. Okay? And of course, when we have biofertility, we don't need as much of that, do we? Okay. Every gram of carbon we add to the soil builds a friability, the rootability, the volume of soil axis. We've talked about that. Every gram of carbon we add to the soil increases the microbial ecology, and it's the microbial ecology that drives the fixation, solubilization, access, uptake, cycling of nutrients, and all those biogeophysical processes in the soil that we rely on. Okay? So this is really a powerhouse, and so effectively it's these positive feedback processes that give us a productivity and resilience of our organic soils, our natural ecosystems. And as we said, they're all synergistic. One times one equals 35 plus. And in a sense, that's a lesson from nature. Okay. I don't want me to write. Okay, it's a lesson from nature. Because basically it is D in nature that drives A. You know, it's D in nature that creates rainforests on sand dunes in the world's most bioproductive terrestrial ecosystem on crushed glass with bugger all nutrients in it, right? And we can do that too in agriculture. We can actually increase the productivity of A by building these synergies D. And on top of that, by building these dividends, these synergies, guess what? We can negate the need for most of these expensive inputs that are oxidative both of our soils but also of your bank balances. So we get to lower input, higher yielding, and much higher nutritional integrity food. Now I'll, I'll stop there because we want to have a cup of tea and a break. But basically what we really said here is the building blocks for soil health, soil regeneration process levels, and if you like, we can now apply these, yeah, how do we use this to cool the planet, how do we use this to build high nutritional integrity food that addresses our health needs, because as I said, there's 7.5 billion of us, uh, when I started there were only 3 billion people of us, and then we went into the Green Revolution because a billion people were hungry, there's still a billion people hungry, there's a billion people with beasts, and five billion people that are subclinically malnourished, micronutrients at the moment. So we've still got a big preventative health thing to do, so how does that do this? And perhaps if you're interested, we could also talk about nitrogen, excess nitrogen here, and how we can actually use this to actually avoid and address and regenerate some of those systems. So thank you very much, and look, let's come back after tea, and if you're still interested, let's explore some of those options.